morning. I just wanted to draw your attention to in the bulletin where it says looking for something to do over Christmas break. Um, if you have kids or don't, and From 9.30 to 11.30, um, and the idea is that people can just come and Christmas Eve candlelight service here at Zion at 5 p.m. on the 24th. That's about one hour. And then our New Year's Eve worship service will be no. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Here in this place, we discover the great things God has done. In story and song, silence and prayer, we are reminded that God's relationship with us lasts forever. Here, together as his followers, we find our true home, where we can run home laughing after being lost for so long. Here, during this holy season, we hear those promises made so long ago of the one who repairs all our mistakes, Christ, of the one who reshapes our brokenness, Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, would you pray with me? God of peace, hope, and joy, we come to you in the midst of a world fraught with troubles. Although the darkness is powerful, open our eyes to the light of your presence. Give us faith to stand against the voices of division and violence. We pray that through your spirit, you would remake us into hope-filled followers. Empower us with your wonder, grace, and a desire to know you more. We pray in the name of the one who comes to us, Jesus. Amen. We will now have our Advent reading and candle lighting.
Our souls proclaim your greatness, O God. And our spirits rejoice in you. We will praise you as long as we live. We will sing praises to you our whole life long. We will not trust in the powerful of this world. The one who gives food to the hungry. Our souls proclaim your greatness, O God. Holy God of joy, we rejoice in the reality of who you are. We live within the joy of your love for us. Our contentment comes and goes. Our happiness ebbs and flows. Our feelings depend upon our circumstances, our physical health, our brain chemistry. But our joy is deeply rooted in our identity as your beloved children. And we give you thanks. Amen. Please turn to number 216 in Voices Together. 216. And now back to 210, please.
I'd like to offer a prayer for our offering this morning. We have a container at the back that you can leave your offerings in. You can also do that electronically. Would you pray with me? Thank you, extravagant God, for your blessings in our lives. We offer ourselves in grateful response, seeking to live with such compassion toward others that your blessings will flow through us to bless our community and our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and take a moment to pass the peace of Christ with each other. This is a way that we greet, welcome, and share the peace of Christ. Let's stand.
That's a wonderful sound. I'm sorry, that's one thing that people on Zoom miss out on. But it's time to sing again. So if you will turn to number 212. Number 212, Voices Together. Two twelve. <laughs> And 220, 220.
It's time for children's story. Children, please come up over here by the brick wall and find a seat. Come on up. Somebody should count how many of us there are. Lots of us. All right. Okay. We have some very smart devices around here. I am really happy you asked the old shepherd to come because I am remembering a long time ago when I was a shepherd. My father had sheep, and he loved his sheep. And I grew to love the little lambs. They are so sweet. But my older brothers were the shepherds out on the hills. And they said, girls can't be shepherds. And I didn't like that. Finally, one day, my father said, you can go along and be a shepherd with us. I have a little sheep that I put out at Christmas time. You can pass this around and then at the end hand it back to me. But I put that little sheep out every Christmas. You want to go ahead and take the sheep? <laughs> there are lots of things to see up here. When I think back to being a shepherd and going out with the sheep, and how much my dad loved those sheep. He tended to them every day and carefully. And sometimes he even gave names to the sheep because some of them had personalities that you wanted to remember. And I named the sheep too, and we were with them all the time. Now, a sheep is valuable in many ways. Can you think of one way that a sheep is very, oh, you know, we didn't talk about the bricks, did we? Pull it out, would you? The brick that said valuable. Okay, it's heavy. I'm not going to hold it. I'll let you hold it. Hold it up for us all to see. And the word on it says valuable. There's another brick here. And what does it say? Hold it up high. And what is its word? Useless. They're kind of opposites. Sometimes it's fun to think of opposite words. Do you want to put the full brick on our wall? Because that will be, and then the brick that is broken, it cannot be used very well at all. So. We could put it there on the brick pile. Okay. I want you to think about the word valuable. Do you have some things that you treasure and they are very valuable? And you watch them carefully and you put them away and you know where you keep them? I have some things that are valuable too. What I want us to think about is the shepherd went out with his sheep and he knew them by name and he counted them and he knew if they were all there. But the night that I got to go with the shepherds up on the hill was really, really special. And I could hold the little lambs. When a mama sheep has a new baby, sometimes she doesn't do very well. And so somebody needs to help that mama sheep, and her name is a you, so that someone can take care of that new little baby lamb. And that was what I did that night out there with the sheep. There was a little lamb and a mama sheep 
that wasn't doing very well, and I got to hold that little lamb and keep it warm and to help it to survive through the night. I also sat with a very old sheep that was not doing very well either. And I felt that I was valuable as the young girl shepherd going out with my older brothers and my dad with the big shepherd. What I want to remember out of that story is that each of us are valuable people. You are valuable whether you are eight years old or four years old or brand new or five. Yes, every age is special and valuable and useful, very much the opposite of useless. So nobody is useless. Everyone is valuable, and God made us that way. And did you know, your, as your mom and dad gave you a name, God calls you by name as well. He doesn't know you just as that little boy or that little girl. He knows you by your name. That's how much God loves us. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, dear God, that you have considered us so valuable that you gave us Jesus. And as we honor Jesus at this time of the year, his coming and his way into our life, thank you. We ask your presence to be with us and to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Pat. Girls can be shepherds, too. <laughs> I'm going to be reading from the New Testament, Matthew 11, 2 through 11. This will be, um, this passage will be Steve's message this morning. Looking forward to it, Steve. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. What kind of man did you go into the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed swayed by every breath of wind? Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Yes, and he is more than a prophet. John is the man to whom the scriptures refer when they say, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Pastor Steve, would you come and share with us? Lord be with you. There were some things we had to adjust to in 2018 when we moved from the Central Valley of California to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. One of those things wasn't agriculture. Sure, the crops are different in Oregon, some might argue better, but even though it was California, we were surrounded by ag. For me, having grown up in Kent, Washington, 
the climate, including the rain, was a welcome reunion. It was a reunion that the rest of the family quickly adjusted to and enjoyed. One adjustment that surprised us was the impact of moving further away from the equator. I experienced the long summer days and short winter days as a kid, but now as an adult and parent, it seems a bit different. Bedtimes felt a bit different in the summer. Time feels a bit different in the summer and in the win winter because of how the sun moves across the northwest sky. We're getting closer to the longest day of the year. Farmer's Almanac says December 21st is the first official day of winter and that it will be the shortest day of the year. Not less than 24 hours type of short, but the shortest period of sunlight in those 24 hours. It's kind of confusing, and so for me, rather than shortest, it makes sense to call it the darkest day of the year, but the darkest day of the year, that probably sounds a bit too depressing and doesn't test very well with focused groups. There's something ominous about putting it that way, though. There are ten, we're 10 days away from the darkest day of 2022. Our darkest days are ahead of us. It almost brings about a visceral fear response, and it's had me considering what is it about darkness that causes people to avoid it and even fear it? With Thomas Edison's first commercial light bulb patented in 1879, we were rarely in the dark. There's always some type of electric, some type, some might say artificial light around us. Our obsession with creating light also reveals our obsession with avoiding darkness. We know very little about what it means to experience darkness like generations before us did. Darkness has a bad reputation and it represents all things unknown, all things scary. I still haven't lost the impulse to, whenever the lights go out, make that annoying ooh sound like we did in elementary school after the lights went out before the classroom movie projector was turned on. <laughs> Quoting Isaiah 9, Matthew tells us, the people who lived in the dark have seen a great light, and a light has come upon those who lived in the region and in the shadow of death. The symbolism of darkness and light, it's common this time of year, and it's common in our observance of Advent. People waiting in the darkness for light to come. On Christmas Eve, we'll be having our candlelight service. It's a great opportunity to come celebrate the birth of our Savior together and sing by candlelight. But sometimes, in our rush to avoid all things dark, to get to the light, we forget that we still have things to learn in the dark. And our rush to the light, we forget that it's important to recognize and be honest about the darkness, rather than just pretend it's not there. In her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way, new life starts in the dark. Whether it's a seed in the ground, a baby in a womb, or Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. There are things we learn in the dark that we couldn't learn in the light. Simple things like learning to identify the North Star and the Big Dipper, or how to trust other senses more, like hearing and smell and touch when we can't see in the dark. It's in the dark times of life that we learn lessons about trusting God or which people we can or maybe can't so much trust. In the dark times, our roots are driven deeper and we're strengthened. In the dark, we can't rely on sight to warn us, so we feel more exposed and we feel vulnerable to what we can't see and what we don't know. It's that sense of unknowing and vulnerability that we get from John the Baptist. We hear about John here in Matthew 
chapter 11. Last week in Matthew 3, we were introduced to John the Baptist and his message, repent and be baptized, prepare the way for the Lord by living in ways that align with the kingdom of God right here and right now. This week, sort of like the other side, the other bookend, we hear about John the Baptist as his ministry is coming to a close. John had a specific role in announcing the coming of the Lord. John prepared minds and hearts for the one whose coming meant the end of John's era because there wasn't a need to prepare anymore. John was standing at the doorway of the new thing. And being part of the preparation and announcement meant John the Baptist got to see firsthand the events that accompanied Jesus' arrival. John baptized Jesus and Matthew tells us John was reluctant. He says to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you, yet you come to me. Jesus persisted, and John obeyed by baptizing Jesus. John was right there as Jesus came up out of the water, and Matthew describes the scene. He immediately came up out of the water. Heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I dearly love. I find happiness in him. John would have been hearing all about the other miracles Jesus was performing, like healing those with every kind of disease, giving sight to the blind, numerous teachings, including the whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calming the storms, John was the first to hear and see about these things as a first-hand witness. And if he wasn't a, a first-hand witness to a miraculous deed, he certainly would have heard about them. John the Baptist was extremely familiar with the passage Jesus read in the synagogue that day at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. While Matthew doesn't record it, it's there in, in the Gospel of Luke. The story goes like this. Jesus returned to the town of Nazareth where he had been raised. On, on the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did. And as it was his turn to read, he turned to Isaiah, and Jesus read a passage that every Jewish person, including John the Baptist, knew well. Jesus read... The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And if John hadn't seen those events himself, he definitely would have heard about what Jesus had read and said just after. And he says, as he concludes, Jesus does today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. So knowing all of those things, knowing that John was there for all of those things, those miracles, the scripture reading in the synagogue, why did that same John the Baptist need to have his followers ask Jesus, are you the one who's to come or should we look for another? I think it's because John finds himself in the midst of darkness. And in the darkness, sometimes we forget what we know in the light. John's in prison. John's confronted with not knowing, not seeing, not being able to control his future, what's out in front of him. John feels powerless amidst the darkness he is facing judgment and sentencing by corrupt King Herod due to a plot by Herod's wife for revenge against John. So John asks this question of Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another in the midst of dark days? He doesn't understand why things aren't going better for him. He doesn't understand why Jesus, the one with the power to perform miracles, hasn't sprung him from jail yet. After all, it's right there in the passage Jesus read from Isaiah, the passage Jesus proclaimed 
he was fulfilling. Preach good news to the poor and proclaim release to the prisoners. So John wants to know, Jesus, you're supposed to be getting me out of jail and it's not happening. I'm facing death. It's a bit of a dark time for me. All these other signs and miracles have happened, so I thought you were the one. Only, why am I still here locked up if you've proclaimed the release of prisoners? And Jesus, he sends a message back to John through John's followers. He says, go report to John what you hear and see. And Jesus quotes the same passage from Isaiah. Those who are blind are able to see. Those who are crippled are walking. People with skin diseases are cleansed. Those who are deaf now hear. Those who are dead are raised up. The poor have good news proclaimed to them. And Jesus ends this message to John's followers and to John with an additional note. Happy are those who don't stumble and fall because of me. Jesus quotes the passage from Isaiah, at least references it, about what the Messiah is going to do, but Jesus leaves out one part. The part that John was most interested in. In his message back to John through his followers, Jesus leaves out the part in Isaiah about proclaiming release to the prisoners. Jesus is answering John's implied question and telling John, no, I'm not getting you out of jail. Yes, I am the Messiah. There's something happening here that John does not understand, and it's unsettling and disappointing, to say the least, for John. Which is why I think Jesus adds this part, happier those who don't stumble and fall because of me. Jesus is telling John, yes, I am the one who you have been preparing for. The one who you have been inviting people into a baptism of repentance to prepare for. You have seen and heard the evidence of that for quite a while now. Only, I'm not going to get you out of prison. Jesus concludes with some amazing accolades about John's greatness for the watching and listening crowd. I've got to say this is not one of my favorite passages about joy, about celebrating this time of year. It's definitely not my favorite passage about preparing for the coming Messiah. John the Baptist is left in a very dark place. He doesn't get the answer he wanted. But... Well, this may not be our favorite or my favorite, I think it's an essential passage because it is the human experience. This passage acknowledges the right now and not yet nature of the kingdom of God. The Messiah has come and yet we continue to wait and hope for a time to come when all will be restored. A time when Jesus won't leave out proclaiming release to the prisoners or any other part of that passage from Isaiah because all will be restored. We still experience pain and sorrow, the darkness. Brokenness still exists in our world. John had some of his followers ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or should we wait for another? Jesus responded by telling John's followers to report to John what they hear and what they see. The story of what those followers heard and saw would certainly give evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. Only Jesus and Jesus' ministry was not going to perfectly match the expectations that John had. Jesus and Jesus' ministry was not going to perfectly match the expectations of John's followers either. There's sometimes a big difference between what we expect the Messiah to do and be and what the Messiah is in perfect love and what the Messiah actually 
does and brings about. I don't understand all of those differences, but I do know that as we await the coming of the Messiah, it's important to ask and spend some time reflecting what kind of person, what kind of ministry, what kind of relation to us are we anticipating in the Messiah? What kind of expectations do we have of the Messiah and of the kingdom of God? This passage shows us that sometimes the Messiah disappoints the expectations of some. In the midst of Advent and the darkest days of the year, there are things we can learn, things we can't learn under intense LEDs and artificial light. There are things we can only learn in the dark. In the dark, we hear, we understand some new thing, a new birth that is waiting but cannot yet be perceived, a seed dying and taking root underground. The darkness of not knowing, not seeing, not controlling is always present, sometimes at the very margins of our living. But we also know that a lack of light should never take us by surprise. We live in the midst of a broken world where violence, isolation, and oppression, and sin they're present and even constant. We live in a world where the death of an innocent man named Jesus, who experienced this world's violence and brokenness just like we do, has brought about an inexhaustible source of restoration and light. Wherever you might be asked to enter the darkness, may you know and trust that the light of our Messiah Jesus Christ is also there, a light that easily overcomes any darkness. Please turn to number 211, 211, Wyatt will be singing the first verse. Hope is a candle once lit by the prophet, never consumed though it burns through the years. Dim in the daylight of power and privilege when they are gone, hope will shine on. so near 
Thank you, Wyatt, for sharing your gifts with us this morning. Beautiful. Thank you. So I'm wondering if anyone found the typo in the bulletin today. Anybody find it? So I just want to say, you know, staff, we're human too. And we do proof the bulletin, but we did not realize that the church office will be open 9 to noon on Tuesday, December 27th, not November. And staff will have minimal um, office hours between Christmas and New Year's. So, sorry about that. I want to lead a prayer for our prayers of the people that is by Margaret McGee. And it's inspired by Isaiah 35. I want to ask you to also respond when I say the words, we rejoice with joy and singing. Your response will be, for the coming of the Lord is near. Let's practice that. We rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. Again, we rejoice with joy and singing. Coming of the Lord is near. Let's pray together. We have listened to God's word, and now we come, full of hope and patiently waiting to offer our prayers to God, saying with one voice, we rejoice with joy and singing. For all who walk in God's holy way, those in pews and in pulpits, those at home and on the streets, for all who carry God's promise in their hearts, for all who carry the good news into the world, we rejoice with joy and singing. For the nations and their leaders, that eyes may be opened and ears unstopped, and that peace and justice break forth in every land. We rejoice with joy and singing. For this community and all who live in it, each member of the whole body, friend and stranger, parent and child, brother and sister, widow and orphan, Strengthen weak hands, O God. Make firm, feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Do not fear. We rejoice with joy and singing for the coming. For all who are precious to God, the lonely, the out of work, the sick, the fearful, the cold, the hungry, the one who is sorry, and the one who is ashamed. It is you, our God of hope, who sets all prisoners free. We rejoice with joy and singing. We are waiting, O oh God, with all the patience that we can get together. Beloved angels and archangels, lover of saints and sinners, God our Savior, to you alone we pray. With joy, we rejoice with joy and singing, for the coming of the Lord is near. Amen. Would you stand with me for our benediction?
in God's kingdom of peace, prepare our hearts for God's realm opens up a new day. We yearn for the time when the wolf and the lamb will live together in harmony. Prepare the way. God promises a new day. We dream of a world transformed by God's love. May the God of hope fill your hearts with all joy and peace. We rejoice for God's spirit is in our midst. Go in peace.